Hi, I'm Paul Brody. We're back in my shop after going out to UFV. It was very nice of them to allow us to go out there and use the surface table, so thank you UFV. I, I neglected to thank them last video. Today, we're gonna do a little bit of a shop tour. We've had people asking for a shop tour, so we're, what we're gonna do is the frame building part of my shop here. Years ago, I'll tell you a quick story, when I was working at a bicycle shop, this was 1983, I was new, I didn't know much about bicycles, but I was enthusiastic. And I heard stories about frame builders. And one of the stories I heard was that if you ever went round to a frame builder shop, probably he hid his jig in the back because he did not want anyone to see his jig. There was this huge mystique around frame building and frame building jigs. Then I heard another story that if you went round to a frame builder shop and he showed you his jig, that was a magic moment. So that's what I remember. Things have really changed since then. Now I can grab my phone, I can go online, I can look up a jig, I can add it to the cart, and I can have it here in a week or something. So things have really changed a lot. Uh, we're gonna start out by looking around the shop a little bit. People have noticed that I have motorcycles as well. And there's been quite a bit of interest in that. So I wanna show you my motorcycle projects and then we'll do the shop tour, okay? I have a 350 Aramaki here. Over in, in North America, they were sold as Harley Sprints. So that's where the Sprint comes from. This is a 1970 model. So it's 50 years, 51 years old. And I did a bad thing. I left it upstairs where there's where there was no heat, now there's heat, and I left it for nine years with fuel in the tank, so I'm dealing with that situation. I feel a bit bad for the bike. This is my Aramaki Road Racer. You've seen me make some parts. We've got the swing arm, we've got the front brake, we've got foot pegs, we've got things like that. So this is coming together. I get the front wheel rim on Thursday, then I can build up the wheel and then we can do a mock-up. So I like working on road races. It's my favorite bike. Speaking of road races, this is a bike which I made back in about 2007, 2008, and I call this Ruby Racer. It's got an Excelsior motor. It's a thousand cc overhead cam v-twin it's got a transmission it used to have a triumph transmission of five speed now it's got a ducati six speed transmission i made the housing i had the castings made this is not a real gas tank it's just a cover let's have a look underneath i'll show you what's there so one of the of the problems of installing a Ducati transmission is because the uh, the transmission wants wants to take off on the motor to be on the right side and on the Excelsior it's on the left side so it comes up here with a belt and this is a jack shaft that runs through and then it runs the primary gears on the other side it was quite an engineering I won't use the word nightmare, but it was a challenge. Let's say that. This is the fuel tank. It's, it's kind of small, but all I was doing was, was five lap sprint races. And you can see the carb here. This is a, a Spanish Amel carburetor. I modified it to be a down draft. I had to redo the float bowl here. And then if you look down, if you look down here, you can see the rocker covers, you can see the camshaft in the middle, and there's the valves and the valve spring. So it's pretty neat for a 1919 motor. I got a couple of things I'd like to show you. You see here, this is where the frame comes off the head tube. And if you go around the other side, it's basically what I call a one-sided frame. I can't think of any other motorcycle that has a one-sided frame like this. Around the other side, you bicycle guys will notice that I have an s, &S coupler here. When I take out the motor, it comes out like so, and this tube is in the way. So when I slacken off this, and I take out the two Allen screws there, 
it comes apart like that. So there's your SNS coupler, and then to put it back together again, just do that. That's a pretty good fit, eh? And then the two Allen screws go in there. I know you're not supposed to use SNS couplers on motorcycles, but just don't tell anyone. I still have to finish it because the transmission has to be shimmed and I got a few other things to do. Okay, let's go to the frame shop and we'll look around, okay? We're at, at my park stand now. I've had this for years and it works really well. Someone was asking about the base. So I've made it really strong. You can see how it's anchored into the concrete. I've got a couple lag bolts going down there. So what I want you to see is this, is that I can't move it. It has no movement whatsoever. This piece of, of pipe, it's not tubing, it's heavy wall pipe. It's 3.5 inches. And if you want to know the height I set this at, it is 48 and a half inches up to the top. So in case you were wondering that, I've modified this. What I did is, I took the, the, uh, I took the park stand post, it's got holes in it so that you can, you can position the arm in three different ways. I took that off, I took a motorcycle fork tube, I welded that on and now I've got a pinch lug here. And if I want, it's a little snug, I honed it out, but I can move it up and down. And if I don't want it sticking out here, I can move it out of the way. That's a nice feature. Also, when I'm, uh, I was, had a frame in here and you move the frame around, sometimes this wants to wander out and it can fall on the floor. So you see here, I've got a ball bearing. It doesn't have to be a ball bearing, but when I'm moving this around, see how the bearing moves? This is never gonna fall out, never. I, on the top of the post, I took a piece of, of Delrin, that's just the hard plastic, and I made an insert, and that holds my light really nicely. When you hold a frame, you wanna hold it with something. I took the rubber off, because with all the heat and stuff, so I use leather, and when you've used it a lot, that's what it looks like. And if you've got a really small tube, you can put one piece inside another. I don't have the small piece here, but you can, you can do that. So that's my park stand. I made a shelf. I took a piece of inch and a quarter tubing. I made an insert. I screwed it into a base. It fits right into the park stand and it's really handy. It's like a little shelf if I need to hold something like that. Very, very handy shelf. I'm standing next to my surface table. We just did a video on alignment. So I, if you watch that, you know a little bit. So it's basically 18 by 30 when I was building the table. I phoned around to all of, all of our, our local machine shops and I asked, what's the largest rectangle you can grind? It's Blanchard ground. That's where they have a big wheel. This sits on a, uh, on a magnetic chuck. It's huge, it's like six feet across and this goes around and around and every time it goes under the grinding wheel, it takes off a few thou. So 18 by 30 and if you wanna know how high I set it at, I'll tell you that, 38.5 inches to the top. I made the base, and if you look here, see the Allen screws? There's one Allen screw, it's a countersunk Allen screw, and it goes into each leg, and the legs are bolted to the floor, so this table, it does not move at all. This is the, is the head tube alignment stick, I think that's what we called it. And then we have four pieces of inch by inch cold roll. You just buy them at a metal shop, nothing fancy. And that's how it all goes together. It's a nice system. Yes, these are known as the hooks. So if you bend a frame, this 
alignment rod goes on. You see how it just fits under there? There's a, li a little bit of clearance, not much. That's all you need. And then you can put pressure on the seat tube to make the frame straight. Every frame builder needs something like that. Let's talk about frame jigs for a little bit. In, in frame, building, frame Building 101, all the students had to make a little, what I call a baby frame. And it was good for them because they got to learn how to miter, how to tack, how to file, things like that. So this is a really simple little jig. And you can see how the frame fits on that. Let's look at my frame jigs now. I have a couple of frame jigs here that I made. This one was made in 1985 and it's done well over 4,000 frames. This one was made in 2015 and it's done maybe 50 frames. It does the front, uh, it does the front part of the frame only. I have other jigs for chain stays and seat stays. And someone was asking, let's do a video about a frame jig. Well, <clears throat> I don't think I want to make a whole frame jig in a video, but why don't I, I take this apart and just show you, and then you can see that it's actually pretty simple. And if you have a lathe and a mill, you can make one too, because you'll save yourself a lot of money. There we go. So what's going on here is there's a piece of metal. This is like half by four. And then I, I, I bolt on these rails here. These is, is inch by three sixteenths. And this just slides. Can you see how there's another piece of aluminum that goes in there? And I've, there's a little bit of slop, not much, and it slides back and forth. I have a pointer that does the front center. I have a tiny little shim so that this doesn't bolt right under there. See, it's just, I just took a piece of sheet aluminum and made up a little shim. That's all it is. And there's an offset here. If you take a ruler down here, it's 45 millimeters and that's what a standard fork rake is. So there's not really any rocket science going on here. And then it just all bolts back together. It's, it's pretty simple. And no, it's not an anvil jig. Anvil is like the Cadillac. It's a beautiful jig but I don't have one. And it's the same thing here. This just, here, I'll take this apart quickly and then you can see this too. And that thread there, it's just ready rod. I didn't even make the thread. I just, I bought the thread. So, it's the same thing here. There's the little shim that goes in between the two. I marked out what the drop is from the bottom bracket. And see how this piece, the piece of aluminum, it just slides. That's all it does. It just slides up and down. It's nothing fancy. But you can make a lot of good frames. On the frame jigs, I was teaching out at, at the university, Frame Building 101. And then as the students came in, they wanted more stuff. They wanted wider bottom brackets. They wanted to build fat bikes. They wanted one... 42 spacing and then it went to somewhere else to 157 170 so see all these spaces in here this is the space out parts on the on the frame jig for example this spacer would go in here and then that was for an 83 millimeter bottom bracket so then we would have to space out this too so there was there's all these little things and then this is for all the different sizes of, of seat tube. You see how that holds the seat tube there? We had all different sizes of seat tubes, so I had to make up a whole bunch more things for the frame jigs so that we could accommodate what the students wanted to do. It was, it was a good learning experience for me, constantly making stuff. What you're looking at here is an Aramaki Road Race frame jig, and this is what I used to build the frame over there and the side plates bolt on this. I've got a, 
a, a little bit of a, an adjustment for the head. Can you see here? That's the head tube angle. And so you probably think the numbers are really small. In the motorcycle world, the head tube angle is measured from the vertical. And in the bicycle world, the head tube angle is measured from the horizontal. So how did that happen? Because years ago, 100 years ago, bicycle, motorcycle, they were really close. They've kind of become separated over the years. In my shop, I have an elevator. I made this several years ago and it's got a, a two and a half ton electric hoist. Can you see up there? It's a two speed as well, so. I can go down slow. Just wanted to show you my elevator. Everyone needs an elevator in their shop, right? I think some people think that if they've got a frame jig and a surface table, they're all set, they can build frames. But what I'm trying to show you in this video, what we're trying to show you is that there's a lot of small pieces that are maybe off to the side a bit, not in focus, like the frame jig and the surface table and all these pieces, they're all really integral for a frame builder to make a frame. And every frame builder has their own way of making frames. What I'm showing you is the system that I came up with. I'm self-taught. There was nobody really showing me. I came up with a lot of this stuff myself. So if you have a lathe and a mill, even if it's a small mill, you can make your own frame jigs too. You can make all these little pieces time consuming but it's very satisfying when you make your own stuff. We have a frame here it's a shop frame it's black it's aligned perfectly that should give you a clue. If you need to hold the frame in the vise you need some sort of, of, of protection for the bottom bracket shell so what I have is bottom bracket cups and these are made you can make your own what I did is I took a a fixed cup. This is the really old style, right? Where you had the axle and sometimes loose bearings. And, and if you grind off all the threads carefully and don't put any marks on that face right there, then you end up with a set of bottom bracket cups. So you don't have to have a whole lot of money to make these. You just have to find old cups. And then you can hold the frame in the vise. Speaking of the vices, there's been some, uh, some comments asking about the vise. This is a, it's a five inch record vise made in England. In Canada, these are pretty common. I don't know where you live, but maybe you can find one. It's a good vise. They were made for years. I think they're still being made. I've got a selection of thing items here that hold the tube. So we have the basic V blocks. I made these. You put them in the mill vise at a 45 and the end mill cuts out the V like that. These are made out of mild steel and then they are, are case hardened. It's where they harden the surface to maybe, I'm guessing 15 thou. And they harden it to something like 65 Rockwell. So if I take a file, it skates on the surface. You, you cannot file this. It's very, very hard, but only on the surface where it needs to be. I've also got some aluminum V blocks. Those are made the same way. And then when we, we cut the slot in the seat tube, we have to hold the frame really securely. So that's where these come in and there's one for inch and an eighth and the other one is, I think it's 31.6. So there's a couple different sizes. So what I want to do is, is to miter a tube and I'll show you something on the mill and then we'll move on to the next part. What I want to show you is this here, it's like a shelf. And when we were building a lot of frames, this got used all the time. If you put the, if you put the tube in into the vise and you don't have something like a shelf here, if the tube moves a little bit because you don't want to hold this super tight because you'll put marks into the tube, that's about as hard as I want to hold it. 
and I can just move it. It's not held that tight. I use a spacer and then as I miter, I press down as I pull down the hole saw, that tube never moves. This is a really good system. Now, if you're doing a bunch of tubes and you want them all to be the same size, you see this shelf here, see these holes? I can, I can bolt this, I can put the Allen screws up there and that's, that can be my stop. And then I can also move this along like so. So this shelf is a certain height so that when I'm going to miter the down tube after the bottom brackets on it, when I'm holding this part of the tube in the V blocks and the bottom bracket is resting on here, it's perfectly the right height, it's level. So it was designed with that, those features in mind. So I'm going to center this, I'm going to, I'm going to make a miter and then we're going to move on to the next part. Take two pieces of small flat bar and you put it on either side and you're looking for the space. Can you see there's more space on this side? So I move the table back a little bit and went a little too far. And that looks pretty good to me. It's not a perfect system because some hole saws have a little bit of run out. So you don't know where you're setting on. Maybe the hole saw is perfectly straight. Most of them have a little bit of run out. We're gonna miter this tube and then I'll show you more stuff. I have a bottom bracket shell, I have a down tube. So this was made years ago. It's a, it's a disc brake off a motorcycle, a really old one. This is 68 millimeters wide, so I can take my fingers and I can center the bottom bracket. You see that? I can move it, I can feel the center. And then there's a little gauge here. And we made this up. And that tells you if the, if the tube is in the middle and then you look up here straight on and if the tube is off to one side, you can see it and then you have to do some filing. But this one, this one looks good. So, so the miter is good. So that's a handy tool. And then if I'm, if I'm TIG welding, I do a tack flip it over, do a tack, and the same thing in oxyacetylene. And then, then the down tube is onto the bottom bracket. That was a good miter. Okay, you're building a frame and it's time to put a water bottle braze on on. So you need to hold it somehow. So obviously the braze ons go there. So this is one solution. This is a holder that does both at the same time and it fits in like so. We've got a broken stud there so it doesn't quite fit. But, but, but that's the idea. It rests against whatever tube is at a right angle to it and you silver solder around like that. Now if you're just doing a single braze on, you can have something like so. It got made out of an old, old, old coping saw. You can see the shape of the saw got some weights added on and a little piece that comes down. So now you want the frame to be horizontal and you can do one at a time. And that's gonna hold the water bottle boss level because if you don't use anything, I've seen it. One boss goes one way, the other one goes the other way. It looks terrible to me anyway. So that's a couple uh, solutions and you can make them. They're not that hard to make. This is just to show you how you can make a simple fixture out of not much really. All bicycles years gone by used to have a braze on right here for the rear derailleur cable. And so what this does, it positions it at the right spacing at the right angle. And that's how that would work like that. 
Can you see that? Then it's basically, you don't have to hold it or anything. And it's aimed right at the bottom bracket where it should be. And probably, I guess the value of this material steel is a dollar, a dollar fifty, something like that. It's cheap. You just have to make it yourself. And so I'm showing you this because maybe it gives you an idea of how you can make something for your own, own process. Aligning a frame off the bottom bracket. I have a couple of alignment sticks here, alignment gauges, let's call them that. This is the one that I had forever, over 30 years. And you can see that it's pretty simple. It's just eighth inch flat stock. There's a screw on the end you can move a plate which got machined flat. That's how you check a frame. And then you, you flip it over. And if it's the same on the other side, then it's good. This is just a fancy one that I made because we have a video, so I have to make something. But this is easy. That's not hard to do at all. So it's a good way to check a frame. If you want to build forks, a unicrown fork, you need to be able to mitre for the uh, steer tube. So I made up a fixture here that goes into the lathe. If you watch the unicrown video, you'll see how it works. But basically, it goes like that. And then this gets bolted on like so. And then in the chuck, you choose whatever hole saw you want. This is an inch hole saw for an inch steerer. And, and the chuck is moving like that. This sits on the carriage of the lathe and you miter it like that. So as you can see here, I have hole saws. I've got from seven eighths. I've got some other ones too. These are all the standard sizes that I use and they go up to inch and a half. Sometimes you need larger ones, like for a, a 44 millimeter head tube, that would be inch and seven eighths. So you need a selection. These holders, I just made myself. I machined it on a lathe. I tapped a half inch thread. I threaded in some ready rod, jammed it in with Loctite, cut it off, and then I've got a nice thread. I don't have to make the thread. That's a lot of work on a lathe, especially when you've got a whole bunch of hole saws. So, Made my own holes, made my own hole saw holders. What we're looking at here is a fork jig that I made years ago. When we used to make the Unicrown forks, they had a curve and so, and so the jig was made so that this part here sat on the bottom and then we would rake the fork afterwards. Well, don't have my fork rake jig anymore. I'm not really making a lot of forks, but this is how it works now. This is just an inch tube. I don't have a proper steerer tube. So there's a little spring loaded thing. See that? See how that holds it? It just moves up. So that's a simple way of holding a tube into a V, a v block. And then we'll put the blades on like that. So I didn't go out and spend a bunch of money. I made my own fork jig. And then you can move this back to where you want. And then that's where you can tack, take it out, braise it or tick it, whatever you want. Fork jig. If I need to miter a pair of seat stays, this is my fixture here. You can see that this slides and that's for the different lengths. This goes into the milling machine. I hold it in the vise right here. So it's in line with the, with the table. And then got my stops here. Put in the seat stay. Obviously this gets cut shorter and there's the other one as well. Then there's a wedge system that holds it like that. There's a C clamp and then on the back, there's another C clamp and then the hole saw comes down and you set the angle in the mill. So that if you watch the Romax video, you can see this being used. I know it's a little abstract right now, but 
This has done well over 4,000 frames, this same fixture, and it just, it doesn't really wear out. It just keeps going. We are looking at the chainstay jig here, and it just goes into a park stand. So, you, so you, you've got the clamping system here, and then I also put other things into here as well. So I've got a, a table that goes on there. I've got an engine build stand, so it gets used for a, multiple things fits right in there like that obviously we got stays on this black frame but i'll just show you how this works this is the part that holds up the head tube i can adjust it so it holds there see all these axles i can change uh, any any axle combination there so that's for a, a fat bike. When I was teaching, students would come in and say, I want to do this axle. I go, oh, okay, I have to make something. So that's how I got such a nice looking box of different axle sizes. And it's just a couple little V blocks and an Allen screw and you just swap it out. Very handy. These here are hand holds. This is obviously, usually up higher so and so the bottom brackets up higher but it's adjustable i've got all these different threads here eight millimeters and i can i can lower this down this is my handhold and my rest when i'm tig welding works really nicely everything's straight up and down this is my seat stay jig and it goes in, into the dropouts it's hauling the dropouts at at a right angle to the center axis of the frame. And that's when I, I do the tacking. Now I've got different inserts. I've, I've got three different inserts to go into the seat tube because this has to go down a bit more. This one's too big. It's a 27.2, so this must be in a smaller size. And I also have larger sizes as well. So this is also an alignment gauge for when the frame is made. It lets me know if the dropouts are in the plane or the axis is in the plane of the center of the frame. So very handy tool. I have a die grinder I use a lot if I'm filing up a, a fillet braze. It's a Makita. And these are the spiral rolls that I use. See, I got a whole box of them, and that is the, that's the part number. I have a collection of belt sanders, apparently. I didn't realize, but here, here you go, I got four of them. This is the belt sander that got made recently. It's in a video. This is the one that I made in 1985. Oh, I want to talk a little bit about something because some people were saying, you know, like, this is really expensive. Why would you want something like, like that? Because you, I can go on to Amazon and I can buy a belt sander for $39.95 or something. And the belt sander looks like so. It can be narrower here. So I want to show you what the difference is. See this? There's no space there. See the space? I can put pressure on that and I can contour it to the shape of the tube. That's how you file up the fillet braze. So this one, well, okay, this is a Dynafile. So this is not a $39 belt sander. On the $39 ones or the ones like, like this, you can't do that. You can't contour it. And then, and then people were also asking, why does the belt have to go through a 90? Well, the reason that this works so well is because when you press down on this, can you see how it goes down? That's part of, of the beauty of this. There's a spring inside there and it allows you to put pressure on the belt and maintain all the tension. That doesn't happen on these. So that's why these are more expensive. They're a more sophisticated belt sander. This is the belt sander I got years ago off Tom Ritchie. He made this himself and I like it. And this is a Dynafile. It's also a three quarter inch. And this one works fine too. 
So sometimes I use this one, sometimes I use this one. Those are my belt sanders. I have oxyacetylene. I got a Victor uh, torch. It's a J28 and uh, it's got a nice little holder. Oxygen, acetylene, automatic fluxer. There's been a lot of, of questions how much pressure run. I think between two and five pounds, that's pretty good. This is a zero tip, so it, it needs a couple pounds pressure anyway. Mostly I use these three rods. This is the bare bronze brazing rod, 330 seconds. This is the nickel silver rod. This gets confused a lot in the comments with silver solder. They are not the same at all. This has no silver in it. This has 45% silver. It's also available in 56. Silver solder always comes in a coil. Nickel silver always comes straight. They are very different. Here's the fluxes we use. A type B for brazing. This is the flux that goes into the automatic fluxer. I also made a heat sink. So I know other people make heat sinks and you can buy them, but I made this one. I found a spring. I had some bronze. I cut it into three pieces and it's machined. And let me show you how this works. It's a little hard to get it all together sometimes, but as a heat sink, it works fine. There we go. It's a pretty tight fit. And those lines show how far down it should go. There we go, heat sink. If I'm TIG welding a frame, I can get to a lot of the angles around the bottom bracket, but one that I really had a lot of, of trouble getting to is underneath the chain stays because obviously the down tube's in the way. So I made up this, this here. Basically it's, it's a holder of the bottom bracket. There's a, a plate here and the vise is at the same height as this here. So this was made to the height of the vise and the vise is the counterweight and now I can move it round. So what I need now, if this is my welding table, I need a piece of wood here. Let me show you what I do. So if I'm welding now, I've got a handhold here and I can weld the underneath of the chain stays. It's really easy because I've got easy access plus my handholds. Works very well and it's not that hard to make. I have a lathe. I've had this for a number of years. Very handy. You want to machine something, spaces, whatever. It's great to have a lathe. You can find them used. Maybe not super expensive. Over here, I've got a, a drill press. It's got variable speed that I added. That's a good addition as well. And then I have, have my mill. This is a fair size mill and uh, a new one used to be about $8,000. Maybe you can still find them about that. You don't need one this large, but it's nice. So if you have lathe, mill and a drill press, you can make an amazing amount of things. You really can. What's also really handy for me is I've got a rotary table and a digital readout. So the combination, that combination of lathe, mill, rotary table, and a digital readout, you can do amazing stuff. You can make so much. So I encourage you to make stuff. Makes me very happy. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned a few things. Mitch and I both like coffee. If you'd like to buy us a coffee, it would be much appreciated. Stay safe. See you next week.